Hello to all of you. Today we will be discussing the subject wise uh, test for the anatomy. The question 41 to 60 question. Myself, Dr. Shilpia Garwal. Now we come to the question 41. The question 41 is regarding this venous uh, drainage within the cranial cavity. And if we see in this, this is the same picture which has been shown. First of all, we need to identify the the various points in this, the A structure which is being shown over here, this A structure, this is the inferior petrosal sinus. The D structure which is shown over here, this is superior petrosal sinus. C structure which is shown over here is middle meningeal vein. And the B structure which is shown over here is the sphenoparietal sinus. Now over here if you see towards the center this portion is the body of the sphenoid which is having the pituitary uh, fossa in this. And at the either side of this body of sphenoid we have cavernous sinus. This is the cavernous sinus. This is the location of cavernous sinus. Then this vein which is present over here, this is the transverse sinus. And it is continuing into the sigmoid sinus. So this curved sinus which has been shown over here, this is the sigmoid sinus. And this sigmoid sinus will further continue to form the internal jugular vein. Now when we talk about this cavernous sinus, the incoming channels or the tributaries the sphenoparietal and the middle meningeal, both of them, these are the tributaries of the cavernous sinus. And for the superior and the inferior petrosal sinus, these are the draining channels. The inferior petrosal sinus, which is present over here, it communicates or it drains cavernous sinus to the sigmoid sinus. It drains cavernous sinus to sigmoid sinus or we can say it will help in the formation of the internal jugular vein. For the superior petrosal sinus, this is the superior petrosal sinus. The superior petrosal sinus is having a communication between the cavernous sinus over here and the transverse sinus. So it drains the cavernous sinus to into the transverse sinus. Now if we talk about the cavernous sinus, the cavernous sinus, the tributaries of the cavernous sinus are for the cavernous sinus, the incoming channels or the tributaries first of all from the from the orbit from the orbit, the veins which are coming or uh, into and draining into the cavernous sinus, it includes superior and inferior ophthalmic vein. Along with it, the central artery of retina, the central vein of retina. Then from the brain, the veins which are coming from the brain, it includes the superficial middle cerebral vein and inferior cerebral vein. So it includes superficial middle cerebral vein as well as inferior cerebral vein. Then another set is coming from the meninges. From the meninges, the sphenoparietal sinus is coming. The sphenoparietal sinus as well as the middle meningeal vein and to be specific, the frontal trunk of middle meningeal vein. So 
So all these are the tributaries or the incoming channels to the cavernous sinus. When we talk to the talk about the draining channels. The draining channels it includes first of all we are having the superior petrosal sinus. The superior petrosal sinus it is draining the venous blood from the cavernous sinus towards the into the transverse sinus. And next is the inferior petrosal sinus. It drains into the sigmoid sinus. Then we are having intercavernosus sinuses which are actually forming communications between the right and the left cavernous sinus. So intercavernosus sinus which are anterior and posterior and these are between two cavernous sinus. Then apart from this we have superior ophthalmic vein also. The superior ophthalmic vein it drains into all these are draining. So we will write a word drain. It the superior ophthalmic vein it drains into the facial vein. Then we have some emissary veins which are connecting the cavernous sinus to the pterygoid venous plexus. So this emissary vein it is connecting or it is draining into the pterygoid venous plexus. And these emissary veins they are passing through the various foramen for example foramen ovale, foramen restrum and the emissary sphenoidal foramen and then they are going towards the pterygoid venous plexus. Now all these venous channels which are present over here these, these draining channels these are valveless. These are valveless, so therefore the blood can flow in either direction. Now if you come back to the question, the question, the, uh, in the question the answer will be C because C is actually the middle meningeal vein which is draining into the cavernous sinus. So for question number 41 the answer is C. Then for the next question, the next question it says it talks about the axillary artery. So first of all we will discuss the axillary artery for the question number 42, the axillary artery. Now the axillary artery it begins from the outer border of the first rib and it is extending till the lower border of the teres major. Over here, we are having the outer border of the first rib. Then this axillary artery, it begins from here and it is going till the lower border of the teres major muscle. If this is a level of lower border of teres major, this is the first rib. So this level is the outer border of first rib. So if you see the extent of this artery, the axillary artery, the extent of the axillary artery is from this point to this point that is it is extending from the outer border of the first rib till the lower border of the teres major. So this is the extent of the axillary artery. Now when we talk about axillary artery it is actually divided into three parts with the help of a muscle, a pectoral muscle which is coming from the pectoral region. This is the pectoralis minor muscle. This is the pectoralis minor and this muscle is dividing this artery into three parts, a part which is proximal to it or a between the outer border first rib to the upper border of the pectoralis minor this is the first part then the part which is deep to it is the second part and then the part which is distal is the third part. Now uh, 
the branches which are coming from the first part one branch is coming from this is the superior thoracic artery from the second part two branches are coming that is thoraco acromial artery and the lateral thoracic artery from the third part we have three branches anterior and posterior circumflex humeral artery and the subscapular artery these are the branches which come from the axillary artery and if we talk about the relations of this artery the axillary vein the axillary vein is running towards the medial aspect of the axillary artery in throughout its course so throughout in the axilla the axillary vein is present towards the medial side then when we talk about the brachial plexus the brachial plexus is arranged in a different pattern to the first part of the axillary artery then to the second and then to the third part of the axillary artery let's see how it is arranged when we talk about the first part of axillary artery the first part of axillary artery for this the various cords which are present the medial cord of brachial plexus it is lying posterior to this first part of axillary artery the medial cord of brachial plexus it lies posterior to it then the lateral and the posterior cord the lateral and the posterior cord of the brachial plexus they are lying lateral to it and this first part of the axillary artery it is enclosed within the axillary sheath and the axillary sheath along with the axillary artery is including the axillary vein also the axillary uh, uh, pardon uh, the axillary sheath is including axillary artery as well as the cords of the brachial plexus and the axillary vein is lying outside the axillary sheath so it is enclosed by axillary sheath the first part along with the brachial plexus and the axillary vein is lying outside the axillary sheath this axillary sheath is derived from the pre vertebral layer of the deep cervical fascia of the neck now for the second part in the second part now the brachial plexus is arranged in such a manner that the medial cord is lying medial to this artery the lateral cord is lying lateral to the second part of the artery and the posterior cord is lying posterior to it so medial cord the medial cord it lies medial to it the lateral cord it is lying lateral to it and the posterior cord it is lying posterior to this second part of artery regarding the third part the same thing will be over here also but the difference will be that in the third part now the branching of the cord has started so the branches of these respective cords will be present at their respective positions for example the branches of the medial cord will be present on the medial side of the third part of axillary artery and the same for the rest of them so the branches of the respective cords they they are lying at the respective plane so the branches of lateral cord they will be lying towards the lateral side and the branches of posterior cord will be lying towards the posterior aspect of the third part of the axillary artery so now when we come to the question the question says that uh, the answer for this question the question 42 the answer is c the question says uh, for the first part we have to identify the true statement a is wrong because it is starting from the outer border of the first rib b is also wrong because the ulnar nerve it uh, when we talk about the third part the ulnar nerve because it is a branch of the medial cord it will be lying medial to it then radial nerve it is a branch of the posterior cord so it is lying posterior to it so this statement is correct and axillary vein it is actually lying medial to the axillary artery now for the next question the next question is regarding the ligament supporting the head of talus so it is talking about the talo calcaneo navicular joint we will just come to that 
question number 43. For this we have the answer is D that is the spring ligament is there and uh, the joint which has been mentioned over here is the talocalcaneo navicular joint. Now the talocalcaneo navicular joint is a synovial joint of ball and socket variety. If we see this is the talus bone and talus bone is having a head which is towards the anterior side and neck also. Then just below this we are having the calcaneum which is forming the heel. This is the talus, this is the calcaneum. tibia from above. Just anterior to the talus, the head of talus is articulating with the navicular bone. This is the navicular. Now there is a ligament which is which is extending from the anterior portion of the sustenticulum telli of the calcaneum towards the plantar surface of navicular. And this ligament over here, it is actually completing this joint. It is completing the socket which will be formed over here. So this is a socket which will be formed and this is the head. So ball and socket type of joint and it is completed by this ligament. This ligament is the spring ligament. This is a spring ligament and it is also termed as plantar calcaneo navicular ligament. So therefore the answer for this question is D. If we talk about other ligaments which are present in the talocalcaneo navicular joint apart from the spring ligament, the other ligaments, the capsular ligament will be there. Then we have bifurcate ligament, then there is a dorsal talonavicular ligament. And then we have introsious talocalcaneal ligament. All these are the ligaments, all these are the ligaments for the talocalcaneal navicular joint. Now if you see the rest of the options, the rest of, of the options are mentioning the plantar ligament and the deltoid ligament. The plantar ligament, it is the plantar ligament, these are short and the long plantar ligaments and these are specifically present in the or they are supporting the strengthening the calcaneo cuboid joint. The short and the long, they are for the calcaneo cuboid joint. The deltoid ligament which is being mentioned over here. The deltoid ligament is a main ligament and a very strong ligament of the ankle joint. This is a ligament for the ankle joint and it is present on the medial side so it is also termed as medial ligament. It is a very strong ligament and it is triangular in shape. It is present on the medial side. If this is the tibia, this is the medial malleolus. Then again same we have the talus, calcaneum and the navicular over here. This is the navicular, talus and the calcaneum. Now this ligament it is triangular in shape. It is a triangular ligament and it is having superficial part and the deep part. Now when we talk about the superficial part, it is extending from the medial malleolus. It is having three components. The fibers which extend from the medial malleolus towards the navicular. This is the first component of the fiber. This is the first component and it is termed as tibionavicular. The tibionavicular ligament. The second component, it is extending from this tibia towards the calcaneum. 
So this component over here, the second one, this is this is a tibio calcanean. The third component it will extend from medial medullus towards the talus, towards the posterior side. This component is termed as posterior tibio talar ligament. The third component the posterior tibio talar ligament. Now all these components these are the part of the superficial uh, portion of the deltoid ligament. So the superficial part it is having these three parts first, second, third and the deep part it is formed by anterior tibio talar ligament. So this is regarding this question. Now we come to the next question. The next question, it is regarding the dorsal root ganglia. When we talk about the dorsal root ganglia, the question number 44, the answer for this question is C. The dorsal root ganglion, it is present within the dorsal root of the spinal nerve and this is a collection of the neurons which is present outside the central nervous system. That is why we use the term as a ganglion. The specific characteristic of this is that it is having pseudo unipolar neuron. The pseudo unipolar neuron is present in these. The pseudo unipolar neurons in this they are having a body from which a process will come out and this process will soon divide it into two processes which are termed as central and the peripheral process. If this is the peripheral process, it will go towards the receptors, the peripheral receptors and this is the central process, it will go towards the CNS. So this is a characteristic neuron which is present over here. Apart from this, the nucleus which is present over here, the nucleus is centrally located. This neuron is having centrally located nucleus. Apart from this, this the dorsal root ganglion, it is derived from the neural crest cell. and it is consisting of the lipofusion granules. So these are the characteristics for the dorsal root ganglia. Now when we come back to the question, in this we can see the answer is C because dorsal root ganglion it is actually the pseudo unipolar type and not the multipolar. For the next question, question number 45, this question in this we have to identify the place where the nerve will be involved. If we see the characteristics which are present over here, the loss is that the person is not able to hold the paper between fourth and fifth finger. That means if he is not able to hold the, hold the paper, the uh, paper test, this is for the paper test or the card test and this is to check the adduction of the fingers. This means the adduction of the fingers is not uh, is, is affected and adduction of the fingers we know is by the palmar interosseae and the palmar interosseae they are supplied by the ulnar nerve. The next thing which he, the person is not able to do is he cannot flex the DIP of the same finger. That means over here the DIP, the distal interphalangeal joint of the same fingers it is actually the flexion over here is brought about by the medial half of the flexor digitorum profundus. And this medial half is also supplied by the ulnar nerve. So by this we come to know that the ulnar nerve is involved and the point where the ulnar nerve can be involved is just behind the medial epicondyle of the humerus. So for the question number 45, the question 45, the answer for this question is D that is uh, the nerve, the ulnar nerve is involved uh, behind the medial epicondyle. Now when we talk about the humerus, there are three nerves which are related to the humerus at different points. First is at the surgical neck of the humerus, the nerve which is related over here towards the surgical neck of humerus is the axillary nerve. 
So, surgical neck of humerus. The nerve which is related to this is axillary nerve. Then second is the radial nerve which is present or passing through the posterior aspect of the shaft specifically in the spiral groove. So, in the spiral groove the radial nerve is running. Then just behind the medial epicondyle over here the nerve which is related to this point is the ulnar nerve. So, behind medial epicondyle the nerve which is related is ulnar nerve. Now, if there is any compression behind the medial epicondyle, it will lead to the compression of the ulnar nerve and the, the symptoms will be according to the paralysis of the muscles which will be supplied by the ulnar nerve. Now, when we talk about the muscles which are supplied by the ulnar nerve, in the forearm, in the forearm the ulnar nerve is supplying two muscles that is flexor carpi ulnaris and the medial half of flexor digitorum profundus. So, the flexor carpi ulnaris as well as medial half of flexor digitorum profundus. These two muscles they are specifically supplied by the ulnar nerve and they are going towards the medial most two fingers. The, uh, this medial half of flexor digitorum profundus it is going towards the medial side of two fingers and this is the one which will bring about flexion at the DIP joint. Now, the muscles which are supplied by the ulnar nerve in the hand The ulnar nerve it is supplying all the hypothenar muscles. Then it is supplying one <coughs> it is supplying one of the thenar muscle that is adductor pollicis. It is supplying the third and fourth lumbricle. Apart from this, it is supplying all the interosseae that is all palmar and the dorsal interosseae. <coughs> so, all these muscles, these are being supplied by the ulnar nerve. In the hypothenar muscle group, we also include the palmaris brevis. So, the palmaris brevis is also being supplied by the ulnar nerve. And so, as to check the integrity of this ulnar nerve, the test, the, <coughs> the various tests which we use, one is the book from end test. This is to check the integrity of the adductor pollicis muscle. In this we are actually testing this muscle and by testing this muscle we are checking the integrity of the ulnar nerve. Second is the card or the paper test. This is for the palmar interosseae. And third is the Igawa test which is for the dorsal interosseal. So, this is about the ulnar nerve. Now, we come to the next question. The next question, the question number 46, it is regarding the pons and in this we have to uh, see that which statement is not correct. Now, if we talk about the pons, <coughs> For the question number 46, answer is D. When we talk about this pons, first of all we will just talk about the cut section. Uh, if we take a horizontal section of the midbrain and then we will talk about the horizontal section through the pons. So, first of all through midbrain. If we take a transverse section through the midbrain, the various portions which are present in the midbrain, it includes first of all in the center over here, we are having the cerebral aqueduct. This is the cerebral aqueduct. The portion which is passing, the portion which is present dorsal to this cerebral aqueduct, it is the tectum portion. So, this portion is the tectum. And this tectum portion it includes the superior and the inferior colliculi. Then 
when this lower most portion this whole complete portion it is termed as the cerebral peduncle now within this cerebral peduncle the various components are there are three components in this cerebral peduncle it includes first second and third the first one over here this area this is the tegmentum area this is substantia nigra and this third portion this is the crus cerebri now if you talk about the midbrain in the midbrain the second and the third portions that is the substantia nigra and the crus cerebri these two portions they remain constant throughout they remain constant throughout only the tectum portion and the tegmentum portion is changing the tegmentum portion of the midbrain it will continue below as the tegmental portion of the pons now when we take a cut section or horizontal cut section of the pons now over here in the pons <coughs> this portion which is present over here this is the basilar portion the basilar part this is present towards the ventral side and towards the dorsal side we are having the tegmental part this is a tegmental part now this tegmental part is a continuation of the tegmentum of the midbrain only and if we talk about the basilar part the basilar part is having uh, is a is a constant part over here the basilar part is the constant part and it is constant throughout the whole of the pons this portion is having the pontine nucleus apart from this it is it is uh, having the cortico nuclear fibers the cortico spinal fibers the cortico bulbar fibers and the ponto cerebellar fibers all these are running or present in the basilar part the ponto cerebellar fibers these are the transverse fibers and the rest of the fibers they are running longitudinally so all these are the components which are present in the basilar the tegmental part it is having different components at the different levels now towards the ventral aspect over here this is the basilar sulcus towards the ventral side we have a slight depression which is present in the center this is a basilar sulcus and it lodges the basilar artery it lodges the basilar artery so if you see from the ventral side if this is the brain stem this is mid brain this is the pons and this is a medulla over here in the center at this point we are having a sulcus termed as basilar sulcus and this sulcus is the one which is lodging the basilar artery so now if you come back to the question the question it says the question the 46 question the answer will be d in this we have to choose the incorrect statement the median sulcus on the ventral surface lodges the basilar artery this is correct the structure of the basilar part is identical throughout correct and the dorsal portion is continuous above with the tegmentum of midbrain this also we have discussed this is correct now that option d it says the option d is wrong because the pons is connected to the cerebellum with the help of the middle cerebellar peduncle and this middle cerebral peduncles it is carrying the efferent fibers which are running from the cerebellum they uh, they are running from the pons to the cerebellum so therefore this option is not not correct the next question the question number 47 in this first of all the we have to see the arrow the arrow is on the cingulate gyrus if we if we see in the question or we just discuss this question number 47 question 
the answer for this is A that is the NTA nucleus. Now in this a portion of the brain which has been focused or arrow is put on the arrow is on the cingulate gyrus. This is the gyrus which is running parallel to the corpus callosum. Now uh, we have to see that which fibers are running through the cingulate gyrus. The, <coughs> the fibers are actually running through the anterior nucleus. If you see there is a paper cir circuit. In this the fibers they arise from mammillary body. It gives rise to mammillothalamic tract which will reach towards the thalamus and specifically towards the anterior nucleus of thalamus. Towards the anterior nucleus of the thalamus from here it goes passes through the cingulate gyrus which has been pointed over here the arrow has been put over here and from the cingulate gyrus the fibers they reach to the entorhinal the entorhinal area. Then towards the hippocampus, the hippocampal formation. Now from here the fibers they again reach to the mammillary body and they reach via the fornix. So this circuit is being formed which is continuous circuit and um, this circuit or through via this anterior nucleus of thalamus it is responsible for the recent memory and attention as well as for the emotions also. So therefore the answer for this question is A. If we talk about the rest of the nucleus which has been mentioned over here, the B nucleus, the nucleus, other nucleus is the central median nucleus. The central median nucleus, it is actually, it projects to the thalamus. It is actually projecting to other thalamic nucleus as well as to the parts of the basal ganglion that is the corpus striatum. It projects to the thalamus and to corpus striatum. The central median nucleus, the fibers they are coming from the reticular formation and they are actually for the awareness of the pain. Another nucleus which has been mentioned over here is the dorsomedial nucleus. The dorsomedial nucleus it is projecting to the prefrontal cortex. And this nucleus it is responsible for the mood and behavior. The mood and the emotional behavior. Then another nucleus which has been mentioned over here is the ventro posterior medial nucleus. This is responsible uh, for the tracts which are reaching over here. Those are the trigeminal lemniscus. And the solitario thalamic tract. Then we have one more nucleus that is the ventro posterior lateral nucleus. This is for the spinal lemniscus as well as a medial lemniscus. So these are the various uh, other nucleus which has been mentioned over here. All these nucleus are the nucleus of the thalamus. All these are the nucleus of the thalamus. If we talk about the thalamus, it is basically having three parts. It is having anterior part, then medial part and the lateral part is there. The anterior part is having the anterior nucleus. The medial part is having medial dorsal and medial ventral nucleus. The medial dorsal and the medial ventral nucleus is there. The lateral part it is again divided into ventral and the, and the dorsal portions. 
The ventral, it includes the ventral anterior, the ventral posterior and the ventral intermediate. All these are the various nucleus of this portion, ventral anterior nucleus, then ventral intermediate nucleus and the ventral posterior nucleus. The ventral posterior nucleus is the one which is actually including the ventral posterior medial and ventral posterior lateral. When we talk about the dorsal portion of this, it includes pulvinar, then the lateral dorsal nucleus and the lateral posterior. So these are the various nucleus which are present in the thalamus. Apart from this, there are various other nucleus also. That includes the midline nucleus, intralaminar nucleus, as well as medial geniculate body and the lateral geniculate body. So all these are the nucleus of the thalamus, the various nucleus of the thalamus. The question number 48, the question number 48, <coughs> in this we can see there is a viral infection in the facial nerve and it is depicting the facial palsy and it is a low motor neuron facial palsy is there which is having the symptoms, the symptoms which is, pre is presented over here is the saliva drips from his mouth while he is chewing which is a characteristic feature in the Bell's palsy. And if we, if we uh, see in this, the, way, uh, the Bell's palsy in this, the facial nerve is involved and the muscle which are supplied by the facial nerve, it includes all the facial muscles except the muscle of mastication. So over here the answer will be A, that is a buccinator. So for the question number 48, the answer is A. <coughs> when we talk about the facial nerve palsy, The facial nerve palsy can be of two types, it can be upper motor neuron type palsy or the lower motor neuron. When there is upper motor neuron type of facial nerve palsy in this, the contralateral lower half of face is involved. The contralateral lower half of the face is paralyzed. The upper half is not is intact or, or we say it is not affected because it is getting supply from the both sides. In the low motor neuron type, the ipsilateral half of the face is involved. And this includes the whole of the half including the forehead also. including the forehead and this type of palsy, the lower motor neuron, it is termed as Bell's palsy. It is termed as Bell's palsy. Now because the facial nerve will be affected, that means the branches, uh, the motor branches which are given by the facial nerve, all those will be affected. So the when the facial nerve, it comes out from the stylum astroid foramen, it gives the posterior auricular nerve. It gives a branch to the posterior belly of digastric and the styloid muscle. Then after that, the terminal branches are given. The terminal branches, which are the temporal, zygomatic, buccal, and uh, marginal mandibular, and the cervical branches, they will be supplying all the facial muscles. So all the muscles of the face, they are supplied by facial nerve except the muscles of mastication. The muscles of mastication, they are being supplied by the mandibular nerve. Now due to this, the symptoms which occur in the Bell's palsy is, in this if we see, this portion of the face is involved over here. In this we will see that there will be in the forehead region there will be loss of the wrinkling. Then towards the eye there will be difficulty in closing the eye or there will be a slight drooping of the upper eyelid. Apart from this, this angle of the mouth it will go down and there will be difficulty in closing as well as in drinking. There, there will be difficulty in the chewing movement also. The buccinator muscle which is present over here in the cheek it is actually holding the uh, the food uh, with the, uh, against these teeth. 
and because this muscle is paralyzed the food it starts accumulating over here and the angle of the mouth is also going down so as the food accumulates it starts coming out as well as the saliva which accumulates over here it also dribbles so all these are the characteristics of the bell's palsy the next question is question number 49 <clears throat> the question number 49 is regarding the anal canal and the various supports of the anal canal as well as the sphincters the question number 49 first point in which uh, in the one which has been mentioned over here is the puborectalis muscle The puborectalis muscle, it is a part of the levator ani. The levator ani, it is one of the major muscles which is supporting the whole of the perineum <coughs> and it is included as the pelvic diaphragm. If you see this picture, this picture over here is showing this is the whole levator ani muscle which is present on the either side and it is completely covering the whole of the perineal area, forms a pelvic diaphragm. The various components of the levator ani muscle is it includes the pubococcygeus and the iliococcygeus portion. So apart from the puborectalis, it also includes the pubococcygeus and the iliococcygeus component. The pubococcygeus component it is arising. It is basically arising from the posterior part of the pubis and it is going towards the lateral side. Now few fibers of the pubococcygeus, if we see over here, they are actually forming a sling around the anorectal junction over here. So these muscle fibers are forming the sling around here at the anorectal junction. This is termed as the puborectalis muscle and this is the muscle which is actually helping in maintaining the continence over here. It prevents any kind of fecal incontinence. Apart from the levator ani, the perineal body is also there in the perineum which is supporting, which is forming one of the supports for the rectum. And then we are having the lateral ligaments also which are supporting the rectum. Now if we come towards the sphincters which are present in the anal canal, this is a section of the anal canal which is showing the uh, internal sphincter and the external anal sphincter. The internal anal sphincter is this one over here which is on the inner aspect. This is the internal anal sphincter and it is formed by the continuation of the circular layer. It is formed by the continuation of the circular layer. Now this muscle, it is a involuntary muscle, so it is having smooth muscle fibers and it is under involuntary control, so it is under the control of the autonomic nervous system. So this muscle is having smooth muscle fibers, it is made up of smooth muscle and apart from that, it is in the under the control of autonomic nerves, that is ANS and this muscle is in a tonic contraction, it remains in a contracted tone. Now towards the outer side, we are having over here the external anal sphincter, this is the external anal sphincter which is having three parts. First is the subcutaneous part, second is superficial part and third is the deep portion. So this is the subcutaneous part, this is the superficial part and this is the deep part. The external anal sphincter, it is a voluntary sphincter made up of the skeletal muscle fibers and the nerve supply for this, it is supplied by, it is supplied by the inferior rectal nerve. It is supplied by inferior pectoral nerve as well as by the perineal branch of the S4. So if we come back to the question, for the question number 49, the answer is A. Now we come back to the question, if we see the question, <clears throat> in this we have to choose the correct statement. The puborectalis is essential for maintenance of continence. Yes, yes, this is correct. Therefore, the answer for this question is A. B, the internal sphincter is having smooth muscle fibers. 
C, the internal sphincter is actually in a state of contraction. And for the D, the external sphincter, it is being supplied by the inferior rectal nerve and the perineal branch of S4. The question number 50, the answer for this question is B. Now in this, we have to identify the various circumventricular organs which are present over here. The one which is marked over here A, this one is the pineal body. The B, this is a subcomistral organ. C1, this is a subfornical organ. And the D which has been shown over here is a neurohypophysis. In the question, we have to identify that which is being labeled as incorrect. So the answer for this question is C. Uh, the answer for this question is B. Because B1 which has been uh, written in the uh, question is the lamina terminalis, organ, the vascular organ, but it is actually the subcommissural organ. Now the location of the organum vasculism, lamina terminalis is over here. Apart from this, over here the median eminence is present. And this is the point where the area prostema is located. So these are the various circumventricular organs which are present and their specific locations. Now we come to the next question, the question number 51. The question number 51, the answer for this question is B. In this, when we talk about the somites, the somites, they are actually formed from the paraaxial mesoderm. The paraaxial mesoderm, they lead to the formation of the somitomeres and these somitomeres, they will later on form the somites. The somites, they are first of all formed in the occipital region. They are first formed in occipital region and they formed at around 20th day of intrauterine life. The somites which are formed, now they again divided into the components. One component is the sclerotome and another component is derma dermatomyotome. The dermatomyotome, it leads to the formation of dermis of skin as well as it helps in the formation of the muscles. The muscles mainly of the back or we say the trunk and the limbs. The skeletotome, it specifically leads to the formation of the vertebral column in which it contributes to the formation of the various components of vertebrae. as well as it helps in the formation of the ribs. So the answer for this question, question number 51 is B, because it is uh, beginning from the occipital region, so uh, the cervical region in this we will go for the best answer that is the cervical level. The next question, question number 52, in this we have to uh, identify that which is not a clinical manifestation of the lesion which has been shown in the diagram. If you see the diagram, it is actually a cut section of the midbrain and this lesion has been shown towards the, towards the, basal, the basal portions of the cerebral peduncle. Question number 52. 
for the question number 52 answer is b in this if we see that this is the transverse section of the midbrain and we have already mentioned that this is the cerebral aqueduct the portion which is above it is tectum and the portion which is below it is the cerebral peduncle and specifically this portion is the crus cerebri. Now if you see over here this lesion over here is in the basal portions of the cerebral peduncles and this is specifically termed as the Weber's syndrome. This is the Weber syndrome and this occurs due to the occlusion of the branches of posterior cerebral artery. The posterior cerebral artery. Now in the Weber syndromes, the structures which are specifically involved are the oculomotor nerve and the corticospinal fibers. So it involves oculomotor nerve, the oculomotor nerve and the corticospinal fibers now in this because there is ipsilateral involvement of the oculomotor nerve and the corticospinal fibers over here they will be going towards the contralateral portion of the body so this Weber syndrome it is also termed as superior alternating hemiplegia We see the same picture over here. This is the same picture. The substantia nigra, which is present over here, and towards here, this is the crust cerebri. The crust cerebri, it is carrying, it is actually the fibers which are going passing through it. The fibers which are passing through this over here are the corticospinal fibers and the corticonuclear fibers. They are passing over here. Through these portions, the corticopontine fibers are passing. Then this is the position of the cerebral aqueduct. Over here only a nucleus is present, that is the oculomotor nucleus. From the oculomotor nucleus, the nerve exits out. This is a third cranial nerve that is oculomotor nerve. Now the various structures which are present over here, this Weber syndrome is actually occurring at the upper level when the lesion is at the upper level of the midbrain. So over here we have the superior colliculus. Then we are having lemnisci which are present over here. This one is the medial lemniscus, trigeminal. and this one is the spinal. So these lemnisci, these are present over here and if we see the lesion area, the lesion area which has been mentioned over here, this is the lesion area which is for the Weber syndrome. So in this we can see it is involving the the third cranial nerve, oculomotor nerve and the corticospinal and the corticonuclear fibers are involved. The rest of the structures, the superior colliculus, the spinal lemniscus, trigeminal and the medial lemniscus, they are not involved. The spinal lemniscus which is actually carrying the pain and the temperature fibers as well as uh, the crude touch, so that will not be affected. And if we, if we talk about the various signs and symptoms which will occur over here in the Weber syndrome, the various signs and symptoms which occurs over here, for this we have ipsilateral lateral squint. The ipsilateral lateral squint is present because of the third uh, nerve which is involved and along with that there is drooping of upper eyelid. The up, this is also same, the drooping of the upper eyelid because the levator palpebrae superioris is also involved. 
Then the oculomotor nerve is also carrying the parasympathetic fibers which will be supplying the sphincter pupillae and the ciliaris muscle due to which they will be ipsilateral, fixed and the dilated pupil. Now towards the other side, towards the contralateral side, we will be having hemiplegia towards the other side. This is due to the involvement of the corticospinal fibers as well as the contralateral paralysis of lower face. This is due to the involvement of the corticobulbar fibers. So these are the various signs and symptoms which are present in the Weber syndrome. If we come back to the question, the question number 52, the answer for this question will be B because uh, there is no loss of pain and temperature from the face as we have already seen that the spinal lemniscus is not involved in this kind of lesion that is in the Weber syndrome and the rest of the structures they are involved and they will be present, those and symptoms. So the answer is B. Now we come to the next question, question number 53. Now in this question if we see all the various symptoms which are present over here then these symptoms they point out towards the Wallenberg syndrome. So first we will talk about the Wallenberg syndrome. So for the question number 53, answer is A. The answer is A and uh, the syndrome which is being mentioned over here is the Wallenberg syndrome. Whatever signs and symptoms are there, they are regarding this syndrome, the Wallenberg syndrome. It is also known as lateral medullary syndrome. The lateral medullary syndrome and this syndrome is due to the occlusion of the pica artery. The pica that is posterior inferior cerebellar artery which is a branch of the vertebral artery. So occlusion of the pica. And there is ischemia of the dorsolateral part of medulla. Now if you see the portion of this medulla, the portion of the medulla which will be involved, so for this first of all we will see the cut section. This is the TS of the medulla. This point, at this point the inferior cerebellar peduncles are present and towards the ventral side these pyramids are present. The inferior olivary nucleus which is a crumpled bag appearance. Now the various nuclei which are present over here, this nucleus which is present over here is the dorsal nucleus of vagus. Then this is the nucleus tractus solitarius and these are the vestibular nucleus. Then over here we have the spinal nucleus of trigeminal along with the tract of the spinal nucleus of trigeminal. So this is the spinal nucleus as well as the tract of the trigeminal nerve of the fifth cranial nerve. Then just adjacent to it we have the structure which is the descending sympathetic tract, the descending sympathetic tract then another nucleus which is present over here this is the nucleus ambiguous a tract which is running over here this is a lateral spinothalamic tract
Now, when we talk about uh, the Wallenbeck syndrome, which is in which the ischemia is of the dorsolateral portion of medulla, this whole portion is involved. And due to the involvement of this portion, the ischemia of this portion, the various nuclei which are present or the tracts which are running over here, these will be involved and they will be producing the various symptoms. Now, if you talk about the symptoms which are produced in the Wallenberg syndrome, the sign and symptom which are produced, we have contralateral loss of pain and temperature. The contralateral loss of pain and temperature is for the trunk and the limbs. And this contralateral loss of pain and temperature is due to the involvement of the lateral spinothalamic tract. Then apart from this, we have the ipsilateral loss of pain and temperature from the face. from the face and this is due to the involvement of spinal nucleus and the tract of the fifth or the trigeminal nerve. Then if we have ipsilateral loss of or the paralysis, we can say paralysis of the muscles of palate, pharynx and the larynx. This loss is due to the involvement of this nucleus ambiguous. Then ipsilateral ataxia is there. The ipsilateral ataxia is due to the involvement of ips, uh, this inferior cerebral peduncle as well as over here it is this artery, pica artery is also supplying the inferior surface of cerebellum. Apart from this giddiness, the giddiness is present due to the involvement of vestibular nucleus. <coughs> then we have Horner's syndrome. The Horner syndrome, this, is, this occurs due to the involvement of descending sympathetic tract. So due to the involvement of these various structures, the various signs and symptoms which are observed in the Wallenberg syndrome are these. And if we talk about the Horner syndrome, in the Horner syndrome we already know the various components of the Horner syndrome, these are the meiosis, ptosis, anhydrosis and anophthalmos. Along with this, there is loss of ciliospinal reflex. So now in the question, if we see all these symptoms have been mentioned and uh, according to that, the answer for the question 53 is A. The answer is A, that is the right pica branch is involved. So if we come back to this question, the answer is A. In this the right pica artery is involved. Question number 54, which of the following does not supply the palate for the, for the blood supply of the palate? Question 54, for the palate, when we talk about the blood supply, The various arteries which are supplying it, it includes the ascending palatine artery. The ascending palatine artery, it is a branch of facial artery. Then it includes the descending palatine artery. The descending palatine artery, it is a branch of maxillary and it in turn is giving the greater and the lesser palatine arteries. Which will be going and further supplying the palate. Apart from this, we have ascending pharyngeal artery. Its palatine branches, they will be supplying the palate. So, the, this, the, uh, these three arteries, they are mainly supplying the palate, which form the blood supply of the palate. So, therefore, the answer for this question, the question number 54 is, the one which is not supplying it is the tonsillar branch of the facial artery. So, the answer is A. Question number 55, the question number 55 says, the lower border of the pharynx, the lower border of the pharynx is at the level of C6.
if you see the pharynx over here for the question number 55 the answer is d that it is ending at the level of c6 this hole is the pharynx and the pharynx is divided into three portions nasopharynx oropharynx and the laryngopharynx if you see the extent of the pharynx the extent the extent of the pharynx it is beginning from the base of the skull over here and it is going till the upper border of the cricoid cartilage and this upper border of cricoid cartilage it is actually uh, it is actually it is actually at the inferior border of the cricoid cartilage this cricoid cartilage is lying at the level of c6 so the extent it is from base of skull it is from the base of the skull to the inferior border of cricoid cartilage this is for the pharynx and this inferior border of cricoid cartilage it is lying at the level of c6 and at this level of c6 now below it will be beginning or it is it will be continuing as the esophagus so the answer for this question is the d question number 56 it says it, it is talking about the membrana tectoria the next question is question number 56 if we see the membrana tectoria it is one of the ligaments which is present uh, uh, at the base of the skull it is present between the joints which are formed between the base of the skull c1 and the c2 for the 56 question answer is d if we talk about the ligaments which are present over here now in this cut section this is the section of the c1 that is the atlas this is the base of the skull over here and this is the foramen magnum this section is a section of c2 and over here this is the body the body uh, of the axis or we say this is the dense or the odontoid process the dense or the odontoid process of the c2 now the various ligaments which are being attached over here if you see the ligament <coughs> there is a ligament which is present over here which begins from the lower portion or uh, or we say from the anterior margin of the foramen magnum and it is going towards the c1 this is the anterior atlanto occipital membrane same it towards the uh, towards the posterior side the posterior most margin of the foramen magnum the membrane is continuing towards the upper upper <coughs> upper border of c1 this is the posterior atlanto occipital membrane now if you talk about the rest of the ligaments there is a apical ligament which is actually starting from the base occiput near the lower most part portion of the base occiput near the foramen magnum and it is going till the tip of the dens this ligament over here this is the apical ligament the apical ligament is there just behind the apical ligament we are having one more ligament that is the cruciate ligament this one is a cruciate ligament which is having a thick band over here and then it is continuing below this is the cruciate ligament this is a cruciate ligament the cruciate ligament it is having the transverse band and uh, the longitudinal or the vertical band the band which is shown in the section is a vertical band just behind this we have a structure which begins from over here which begins from the base sphenoid portion and it is continuing below and it gets attached to the posterior surface of the body of axis this structure is termed as membrana tectoria and when it is attached to this posterior surface of the body of axis now below it goes it is actually continuing as the posterior longitudinal ligament so this is the membrana tectoria
and below it is continuing as a posterior longitudinal ligament. It continues the membrana tectoria, it continues as posterior longitudinal ligament. The posterior longitudinal ligament, it is on the posterior aspect of all the bodies of the vertebral column. So, for this question, that is the question number 56. The question number 56, the answer for this question is D, that is the posterior longitudinal ligament. Now, we come to the next question, that is the question number 57. This is the question number 57. In this, uh, it, the question is asking about the parts which are actually forming the diaphragm for the development of the diaphragm. In this, first of all, we will identify these parts. The A, which has been mentioned over here, is the body wall mesoderm, the lateral body wall. This is the lateral body wall mesoderm. C over here, C is the septum transversum. septum transversum and D which is shown over here, this is the pleuroperitoneal membrane. The B structure over here, this B structure is the dorsal mesentery of the esophagus. Now, these four structures, they actually form, they combine to form the diaphragm and if you see the question, in the question it says, the question says that all the structures they are forming the diaphragm, in this they have mentioned the septum transversum, pleuroperitoneal folds or the pleuroperitoneal membrane and the muscular ingrowth from the lateral body wall, which is the fourth component. The fourth component is the dorsal mesentery of the esophagus, which is labeled as B. So, the answer for this question is B. For question number 57, answer is B. And if we talk about these various components, in this, the septum transversum, it contributes to the central tendon of the diaphragm. It forms the central tendon of the diaphragm. Then the dorsal mesentery over here, it contributes to the formation of the crust, the crust of the diaphragm and the third along with the first, they contribute to the muscular part of the diaphragm. So, therefore, they are contributing to the different different portions of the diaphragm and in this one of the most common congenital anomaly, the most common congenital anomaly which can be present, the most congenital diaphragmatic hernia is due to the absence of the pleuroperitoneal membrane or the fold and it leads to a hernia which is known as Bogdelex hernia. This is due to the absence of pleuroperitoneal membrane due, due to which it is posterior lateral in position, also known as the posterior lateral hernia. The question number 58, it says, that uh, which of the one is mediating the erection of phoenix ex except the answer for this question is C. For question number 58, answer is C. If you see the pathway for the erection, the erection is actually caused by the parasympathetic fibers. And the pathway for this, when the physical stimuli is there, it passes through the pudendal nerve and then to the sacral plexus. From the sacral plexus, it goes to the spinal cord and within the spinal cord, the parasympathetic component of the spinal cord, so for the parasympathetic component that includes the sacral portion, 
of the spinal cord. From here, the nerves will arise and the nerve which arises from here is the pelvic splanchnic nerve. Which is also known as nervi agentis. And the root value of this nerve is the S2, S3 and S4. This is the one which is responsible for the erection process in the in this genital organ. So if we see over here that the nerves which are involved for this process it includes the pudendal nerve, the sacral plexus and the nervi agentis. The hypogastric plexus is not included in that so therefore the answer is hypogastric plexus. The hypogastric plexus is actually involved in the ejaculation process. So for the ejaculation process The ejaculation is via the sympathetic supply in this the sympathetic fibers they actually they pass towards the hypogastric plexus. as well as the pelvic sympathetic plexus. And this plexus is actually involved for the ejaculation process of this genital organ. So the hypogastric plexus, it is for the ejaculation process and the sacral plexus, pudendal nerve and the nervi agentis or the pelvic splanchnic nerve, this is for the erection process. Now for the next question, the question number 59, in this it says that the 56 year old male patient has a lesion in right medial lemniscus in the pons, what there will be loss of. The answer for this question is A. The question number 59, answer is A, it is basically talking about the medial lemniscus. When we talk about the medial lemniscus, regarding the pathway of medial lemniscus, if this is the cerebrum, midbrain, pons and the medulla, which is continuing below as the spinal cord. This is the midline. The cerebrum is there in which thalamus is there. This is midbrain, pons, medulla and the spinal cord. Now if you see the fibers which are coming from periphery, this is for the medial lemniscus. The fibers which are coming from periphery, they first of all end on the dorsal root ganglion and then they reach towards the spinal cord. So the ganglion which is present over here is a dorsal root ganglion which is considered as first order neuron. This is the first order neuron for the medial lemniscus. Now from here the fibers they will as they reach the spinal cord they ascend without any relaying into any nucleus and without crossing the midline. The fibers they ascend uninterrupted and as they reach towards the medulla they end over here in the nucleus. The nucleus which are present over here are the gracile nucleus and the cuneate nucleus. The fasciculus gracilis portion it ends on the gracile nucleus and the fasciculus cuneatus portion it ends on the cuneate, nu cuneate nucleus. So this is considered as a second order neuron. includes the gracile and the cuneate nucleus.
Now as they end on the second order neuron, now they will cross the midline over here and then they will ascend towards the other side of the brain stem and then they finally reach to a nucleus in the thalamus. The th this nucleus is ventro posterior lateral nucleus of thalamus. From here the fibers will go towards the sensory, sensory area of the cerebral cortex. So the third order neuron over here, the third order neuron is the ventro posterior lateral nucleus of the thalamus. Now over here if we see the crossing of the fibers, the location of the crossing of the fibers is at the medulla. The crossing of the fibers is occurring over here. So now if we see in the question it says that uh, in the question it is saying that the there is a lesion which is in the right medial lemniscus in the pons. That means at this level now the, uh, now the fibers they have crossed the midline and then they have reached towards the right side and therefore that means these are the fibers which has come from the left. So the tract is the left tract, left is, uh, it will involve the left side of the body. So therefore the answer for this question is A, it involves the fine touch, uh, the fine touch sensation from the left side of the body because it is carrying the fibers from the left side of the body. The next question is question number 60. The question number 60 says that left superior intercostal vein it drains into. The answer for this question is D. It drains into the brachiocephalic vein. For this if we see the venous drainage in the thorax, thorax region. In the thorax region the vein, for the venous drainage we have the azygous venous system. The question number 60 answer is D and it is, accord, it is regarding the azygous venous system. Now if this is the superior vena cava, it is being formed by two brachiocephalic veins, the left and the right brachiocephalic vein. This is the right brachiocephalic the right brachiocephalic vein and this one is the left brachiocephalic vein. These two brachiocephalic veins they unite to form the superior vena cava. Now into the superior vena cava on the right side, this is the right side and over here we have the left side. Towards the right side the zygous vein drains into the superior vena cava before the superior vena cava opens into the right atrium. This is the zygous vein. So whatever blood, whatever veins are draining into a zygous vein, they will fin finally drain into the superior vena cava. The superior vena cava, in this we have the accessory hemizygous and hemizygous vein which cross the midline and then they come and drain into the zygous vein. This one is the accessory hemizygous vein. The accessory hemizygous vein and this is the hemiazygous vein. Now which posterior intercostal veins are draining to which portion on the right side? If we talk about the right side, towards the right side, the posterior intercostal veins which are present on right side, The first posterior intercostal vein, it directly drains into the right brachiocephalic vein. The second, third and fourth, they unite to form superior intercostal vein which will drain into the azygous vein. And the rest of the veins, they directly drain into the azygous vein. So that means on the right side from 2nd to 12th all the posterior intercostal veins they are draining into the zygous vein. Only the first right posterior intercostal vein is there which is draining towards the right brachiocephalic vein. Now if you see towards the left side, on the left side the posterior intercostal vein, the first posterior intercostal vein it is, it is also draining to the left brachiocephalic vein. The second, third and fourth over here 
They form the super intercostal vein and that too opens in the left becuccephalic. This is the superior intercostal vein. The fifth, sixth, seventh and eighth, they all open into the SSC hemizygous and from ninth to twelfth, they open up into the hemizygous vein. So this is the whole of the drainage venous system, how the posterior intercostal veins on the right and the left side, they are draining into the different areas. And if you see the question, the questions, they, it is saying the left superior intercostal vein. So towards the left side, this is the superior intercostal vein, which is formed by second, by the union of second, third and fourth posterior intercostal veins. And if you see over here, it is draining into the left brachiocephalic vein. So therefore, the answer for the question is D. If you see on the right side, for the right side, the superior intercostal vein over here, same, it is formed by the union of second, third and fourth and it is actually draining into the azygous vein on the right side. So this, this was for the question number 60, the answer is D. Thanks to all of you.